So today's webinar is on DOIs to support citation of grey literature. I'm Natasha Simons from ANS and I'm going to start with a brief introduction on persistent identifiers. And I'm then going to hand over to my excellent colleague, Dr. Daniel Bangert, from, who's the Senior Data Librarian in Library Repository Services at the University of New South Wales. Okay, first of all, what's the problem that persistent identifiers are trying to address? Well, I'm sure everyone will be familiar with this particular problem. When you click on a web link that takes you either to a 404 page not found error like this one, or it takes you to content that's not actually related to the link that you clicked. And both of these things usually happen because the web resource has been moved to another location and you have the old link. A page not found error is frustrating and in the context of research it's disastrous because it means that a scholarly resource which may have been cited cannot be found, verified, potentially cited again and so forth. And this is the problem which persistent identifiers are trying to address. So a persistent identifier is simply a long-lasting reference to a digital resource. Even if the resource moves location on the web, the persistent identifier is there to make sure the link always resolves. So if a PID is used as a citation link in scholarly literature, it will always resolve to information about the resource, either a descriptive metadata page, the resource itself, or information about the removal of the resource from the web. PIDs are key to facilitating the discovery of scholarly resources and play a key role in linking scholarly resources, for example, publications and data, as well as tracking the impact of these resources. But it's important to note that PIDs do not guarantee a link will never be broken, but what they do is create a framework which helps to guarantee it. So PIDs have evolved quite a lot over the last 20 or so years. This slide's taken from Jonathan Clark's presentation at the Thor webinar last week. And he notes that now we have identifiers for people as well. We want to know what persistence means and how long a PID will last. Metadata has grown, so there is a lot more value in retrieving the metadata as much as retrieving the object itself. And that object may no longer be digital because you can refer to digital information on a physical object, which is a big growth area. And we're looking at that in the IGSN webinar coming up. And last but not least, we want our machines to be able to interpret PIDs. So in this webinar series, we hope to explore more of these topics in more detail. What PIDs apply to research data is a very good question. There are many different types of persistent identifiers that apply to research data. Um, I put on the screen some common examples that ANS actively promotes or provides a service for, such as handles for identifying data, or DOIs for citing data and related materials, or ORCIDs for people identifiers, and really so many more. And all of these persistent identifier schemes uh, differ in some way. For example, they might have a different purpose. Some uh, apply generally to all scholarly resource types. Some are discipline specific. Um, the underlying technology differs between persistent identifiers, as does the governance structure. For example, some are non-profit, some are company driven. And metadata is collected. Some require more metadata than others. And also in the extent of use. So PIDs vary in their uptake. If you'd like to know more about persistent identifiers, there is a PID guide on the ANS website and there's a lot of information about our DOI and handle service as well. There's also this Short Bytes webinar series and I highly recommend the Thor webinar series on PIDs. Uh, the first one happened last week and it was a general introductory one and that's been recorded and uh, they are making the recording available by the end of this week. And then there are another two coming up on that series. So if you'd like to register, you can click on those links. So I'd like to finish now and hand over to my colleague, Dr. Daniel Bangert. Okay, okay Daniel. thank you, Natasha.